that celebration alive. Um, I think so far uh, the day has gone pretty much exactly the way that my dad would have expected or wanted for it to go. Um, we're going to have some speeches now, as everybody is aware, and in true Scott fashion, we get started a little bit late. <laughs> so thanks for waiting on us. Thanks for waiting on the Scott family one more time. Um, we have several people that have prepared comments, and then after that, uh, uh, after we, after they've uh, had an opportunity to share with you, um, if we have enough time, we're going to open it up to anybody else that might want to say something. So feel free to do that if you'd like, and if you don't, that's fine too. Um, before we get going on this, and before we have uh, Craig Lukoyak come up and say a few comments, uh, I'll just I'll just begin. I think I've been able to uh, talk to a lot of you today. So it'll be a little redundant here, but um, just an explanation of what we're doing here today, why we're um, doing a celebration of life. I know a lot of people were looking in the newspaper or calling us or contacting us and wondering about you know funeral arrangements and things of that nature. My dad was not, my dad was not a uh, religious man. He was a spiritual man, though. And, uh, of course, believed in being a good person and doing good things. And he told me... I don't know when he told me for the first time, but at least 15 years ago when he was having open heart surgery, he said, hey, if something happens to me and I don't pull through this thing, he said, don't, uh, don't go, you know, spending a bunch of money on things that I don't want you to spend a bunch of money on. Throw a hell of a party on the great one. <laughs> and that was just like him, right? That was 15 years ago. He still had a lot of life in him. Um, so we talked later. Obviously, he got sick. And so we had some more serious conversations about that. He just reiterated to me that that's what he wanted. He wanted his friends to get together. He, he uh, I think uh, the thing that probably upset my dad most in his life through the years, more than anything, was when, uh, is that he lost a lot of friends and so many people that he loved dearly. Uh, being in the insurance business, uh, when he first joined and realized he, he was decent at it, um, his mentor, Nate Kaufman, in the business told him, Freddie, the only bad thing about this business is you're gonna get to know uh, and care. He said, I can tell that you are going to care about your clients. And he said, you're going to have to deliver a lot, a lot of death claims to families. So make you feel good that you've taken care of them. But he said, it's tough. And, and later in life, I don't know, 15 years ago, he started seeing those things happen. And he would always, anytime he had a death claim, he said, yeah, Nate Kaufman warned me about this. But um, he absolutely felt passionately about us all getting together, having a good time. It would make him sad every time he lost a friend. There's a lot of people uh, that he wasn't just acquaintances with, but we're talking, I, I, I estimated earlier today, there's probably close to 100 people um, that my dad was really good friends with, not just acquaintances, but really good friends with, who have passed away. He hung out with such a, a, a diverse group of people. We're going to hear from my friends today. He wanted to know my friends. He just didn't want to uh, spend time with them, but he wanted to know them and get to know them and be with them. And same thing when he was at Hillcrest Country Club in 1979, we got his membership application, and he actually joined Cricket Stick that same year. Must have been a good year for him. <laughs> um, but and he was also a member of CCI uh, at the time, so eventually I think he wised up about three, three country clubs in 1979 were too many even for him. But, you know, you, you get to know so many people, and he wanted to get to know, you know, when he was, how old he was. 40 years old. He wanted to play golf with the guys who were 60 and 65 and 70 and, and get to know them and be friends with them. And so, you know, my mom's over here, she can she can tell you that all the people they spent so much time with weren't just people their age, but they were people older than them, younger than them, um, and they're friends. And they became authentic relationships and, 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 and you know, would impact him deeply. I would see it all the time when a good friend of his or somebody he knew would pass away. This is going back 20, 25 years ago, um, all the way up until now. So. He knew very, very clearly what he wanted. He knew people were going to be emotional. He knew the family were going to be emotional. But he also said, I lived one hell of a life. <laughs> he packed a lot of years into the... Uh, he packed somebody uh, earlier today. Maybe it was Mike Finley or somebody said... Well, um, it was my Uncle Bruce. And he said, buddy, he lived about 130 years in those 80 years. <laughs> and I think that's absolutely right. Um, he knew he was lucky. He knew he was lucky to have everybody in this room in his life. He cared... Uh, and very much about those people that were in his life. And, uh, but he did want us to get together and have fun, and he wanted us to share stories, and you know, we may get a little emotional from time to time hearing this, and that's fine too. But um, 
but yeah, make no mistake, he's glad that we're all here today and having, you know, as one of his good friends used to say, having a final final uh, on the great night, right? So uh, with that, I'm going to, uh, and I'm going to say some things later if I'm up for it. I hope, I think I will be, I hope I will be, and I think he'd want me to be. Um, but with that, I'm going to let uh, everybody else say what they have to say here, I'm starting with Craig McCoyak, who worked with my dad for, to probably tell you how long, but a long, long time. Okay, the key to that was my my name is Craig of the C and the last name Lakoyak. And I know at this time we're going to be sharing some memories about Fred. And I will share one of mine, but before I do that I would like to share a fond memory of his dear wife. I mean, Dina, 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 Dina. Whatever. <laughs> to be a very special lady. It was around 1975 and Fred had recently joined our agency and he and his lovely wife were in attendance at the annual awards banquet. I had the pleasure of being the master of some ceremonies and part of my responsibility was to introduce the new associates to the agency. And after introducing the other, I introduced Fred and Dina Scott. And after my MC duties were finished for the moment, I returned to my table for dinner. I was only seated for about three seconds when this lovely lady said, Excuse me, it's Dinah, not Dina. <laughs> so I took a sip of wine and I looked at her and I said, Dina? <laughs> When you have a name like Lakoia that nobody in this world can pronounce correctly, you can just about mispronounce anybody. <laughs> and now after 43 years, I still call her Dina, and she continues to call me Greg. <laughs> and I love you, Dina. <laughs> okay. many qualities of Fred that I have come to admire, the two of them that stand out for me was his sense of humor and the confidence he had in himself and the people that supported him. One day back in the mid-70s, Fred walked into my office and said, hey, I have a referral to do a deferred compensation plan at a local company. When he mentioned the name of the company, I said, Fred, they're a publicly traded company and I've never installed a plan like that in a, in a company that's publicly <coughs> traded. Uh, and I said, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a, the name of an outfit in, it's actually in Philadelphia. You give them a call, and I think they'll be able to help you out. And uh, they have a lot more experience in the public uh, company than, uh, than I do. So he immediately called those, uh, those people. And uh, the person that he wanted to talk to wasn't there, so he left his phone number. So that afternoon, Fred was playing golf with some clients, and this guy from Philadelphia called Fred and his assistant. Fred's assistant said, oh, I'm sorry, he's playing golf with some clients. And so he left his phone number. So the following day, he calls me down to his office, and he's, going to call these people. This is what I'm talking about, having confidence in, in himself. So he called this individual and he said, hi, you know, this is Fred Scott. And the guy goes, listen, when we call you, we want you to be there and not being on some golf course. And my eyes are like this because I know what is Fred going to come up with next. <laughs> and sure enough, he come up with a dandy. He said, you know, before I even knew you people or your firm, I have been very successful in this business. And you want to know something? I will continue to be. And he hangs up and he looks at me and he goes, you're about to do your first public corporation. <laughs> So now we're working on this case together, and I love it. And so I'm kind of the, the technician guy, and, and so uh, and we had we knew we had four competitors on the case, 
And so I go, I go through all of the stuff that we're going to be doing and everything like this. And then I'm done with my spiel, and now it's Fred's turn. And he goes, listen, there's only two organizations that can handle this piece of business. One is us, and then he mentions this other, who was one of the competitors. He said, and I'm going to make it real easy for you. And he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out a quarter. And he flips it, and he looks. And he looks at it very disappointingly. <laughs> and he said, you know, it, it would only be fair if it was two out of three. <laughs> and so he, he flips it again, turns it over. <laughs> eyes are like this. And he said, listen, I never put much stock in coin flipping. <laughs> he, said, he said, why don't we just prove to you that we're worthy of handling this piece of business? And two weeks later, we got the business. And let me tell you, I'm going to miss that guy. <laughs> Uh, ever a time I wish Fred had fewer, uh, fewer friends, now's the time, so check the uh, fear of public speaking right there. Um, you know, I, I heard a quote uh, a few years ago that resonated with me, and when I heard it, it, it made me think of Fred then, and it, it makes me think of Fred today, and that is, in, in the game of life, you know, your final score is not measured by how many cars you have in the driveway, or how big your home is, or how much money you have in the bank, but it's measured by the number of lives that you impact along the way. And when I look out in this crowd, I, I'd say Fred wanted the game of life. I mean, he, he has a lot of friends that he impacted each and every day of his life, and, and his mind is no, no exception. I've had the privilege of knowing Fred for nearly 40 years, and I'm only 44 years old, so I've known him my entire life. And uh, he has been an inspiration to me, uh, Dinah as well. I'm going to call you Dina now. <laughs> Dina. I probably called you Dina a few times. But uh, he's been just an inspiration in my life uh, for so long. And uh, when I think of Fred, and I was thinking about this over the last two weeks, because I did know the Scots would run late to their own funeral, and I knew I would have time to prepare. But, but it was all about chapters of life. I've known him for so long. And, uh, I had The first chapter was the Mr. Scott era. And then as I matured into a young adult, it became the Fred Scott era. So there's two different eras I'm going to talk about here. And I promise I'll only speak for about 20 minutes. <laughs> so the Mr. Scott era, you know, and I met David in kindergarten. And the first time you meet Fred Scott, no pun intended, but he's larger in life than his personality, his humor, just everything about him, you just gravitated towards. And uh, Mr. Scott was there for me for coaching. He coached me in basketball and baseball. He tried to teach me the game of golf, but I just didn't have the patience. <laughs> and, and you were constantly learning. I mean, he was constantly giving you encouragement. There was never anything you could do. You know, I go to sporting events now with my kids, and parents are getting ejected. Coaches are getting thrown off the court. And there was this time that I played basketball with Fred and, uh, and John Keady. And uh, thanks, Chris. <laughs> He's still laughing at me. And, and Fred was just that absolute wonderful coach and I'm out there and the, the ball comes to me the hoops right there it's wide open and I'm just going up with confidence and I put it in and my team's all mad it's the wrong end of the foot <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding I don't remember the exact words but Fred's encouragement something about in the timeout was something along the lines of Hyatt look at it this way you scored a basket now next time do it at the other end it was always that optimism in people to be able to move on and, uh, and accomplish things and not be demoralized by what they did because Lord knows my team made me feel that way. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the other thing about Mr. Scott that I remember is a lot of firsts. You know, I've known him since kindergarten, so there was a lot of opportunities to get out and do things with the Scots. They're such a generous family. And I started listing my first down. And I mean, my first trip on an airplane, fifth grade, was with the Scott family and Mr. Scott. And I want to apologize to you now for the number of questions I probably asked you. <laughs> because I know I asked a lot. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised you still still allowed me around the house. <laughs> so that trip included my first trip to Florida, uh, which we had a great time at their condo. Uh, I had my first Pacers game. My first Pacers game. When you do something with Fred Dina, it's an event. So you go to the Pacers game. This is back when the Pacers had Granville Waiters, Steve Clark Kellogg, and who else knows who else. But the... The arena was half full. I mean, they had the black curtains up. 
But Fred said, hey, Rob, after the game, we're going to go rob the bakery. And I said, what do you mean we're going to go rob the bakery? <laughs> and he, he run into one of the clerks, and the clerks, like, we got this kid that says, we're going to go up to Broader Bowl. We went to Broader Bowl at the uh, Roslyn there at uh, college and whatever, Broader Bowl had we robbed the bakery. And I went home and I, I was eating donuts. I went to the pastry game. And, and this is how things were. So finally, uh, I got to go to my first IU game. And this was a football game. And I'm looking forward to this because now I got to spend an hour in the car. And Fred's such a good storyteller. He's telling you everything. And we're driving to Bloomington. I'm hearing Fred and Dinah talk about it and just the whole story. And we get there and we pull into the parking lot. And there's just, just tailgate uh, that the Curtises are holding. So I think you used to have an RV or something that you used to park down there in Bloomington. And we show up, this is my first game. And I mean, it's a spread. I mean, I'm <clears throat> nine, 10 years old. And to this day, when I drink a Tropicana orange juice out of the milk carton, I think of that tailgate because it's the first time I had one because I think they had a ton of the donuts and everything from Ross in there. <laughs> but it was first class. And I mean, I don't even know if we went to the game. And we just happened to play in the parking lot and had the time of our lives. So there were so many first. Uh, many, many will not know this, but uh, Fred was the first time I went mushroom hunting, and that was for mushrooms that Fred liked to eat. Uh, just to clarify, uh, you know, we have a diverse audience here, and, and, and that was that was interesting. Where was your farm? Where was that lake? Like Spencer, Indiana. Dave's like, come to my lake. I'm like, let's do it. We get there, and it's like a pond with a house that really wasn't a house. And I'm like, why did Fred Scott buy it? Like, what is this? He's like, I ever want mushroom hunt. I don't know if we caught a whole lot, but I know I, I, I knew your dad just enjoyed it. I mean, he would fry up those mushrooms around the house, and he just loved it. I mean, that was just a happy moment for him. But uh, one of the things that Fred taught me at a young age was numeric speak. Now, numeric speak is when Fred picks you up for a Colts game at 11.50 for a 12 o'clock kickoff, and he has to get his bets in, right? I didn't know what betting was. I'm eight or nine years old. David and I would be in the back of the car, and he'd get on the phone, because he was the first in America to have the car phone, right? <laughs> he'd get on the phone, and here's how it sounds. This is 24, give me a nickel on five. 54, give me a nickel on five, 12, 13, and 18. And I just look at Dave like, what did he just say? <laughs> and I think Dave was just learning, but it kind of cued me in. It's like, uh, my dad's placing some bets. I'm like, oh, all right. So I, I learned about 10 years old how to place a bet in the proper manner. You don't give out your name over the phone. <laughs> and then you don't tell the amount of money you're betting. And then the rest is like a Chinese menu. <laughs> so, so, so there were a lot of firsts with, with, the, with Fred Scott that I just, I cherished. I was driving up today from Nashville and tears rolling down my eyes just thinking of all these stories. So as I was getting older, I could tell Fred was wanting to call me, wanted me to start calling him Fred instead of Mr. Scott. And I had to just talk to this because this was going to be really hard at the time, not now. And, and I thought this would be a, you know, six or seven month transition. And I'll never forget coming home from, from IU. It was uh, first semester, and we were sitting around in the family room. And I said, hey, Mr. Scott, and it's the maddest I've ever seen him get. And that's how crazy this is. He's like, damn it, Hyatt. And he didn't say damn it. He said, call me Fred. You know, you've earned it. You're 19 years old, for God's sakes. And it was just that transition of life went from Mr. Scott to becoming Fred Scott to becoming a friend. And Dinah, I'm sorry. I know it took me another year to call you Dinah, but <laughs> I worked at it. I worked at it. So, so when I think of Fred Scott, um, there's so many words that come to mind, but uh, three that stood out to me um, as I was trying to prepare something was the love that he has for his family, uh, his immediate family, his family's, uh, his children's friends. I've never heard a man say I love you to his children more than Fred Scott. If he said it once, he said it 10 billion times. Uh, he said it all the time, he said it to his wife. Austin, when you came into this world, he was just head over heels in love with you and Jack and George and Ollie as well. I mean, the man's family meant everything to him, but then all of us friends. I mean, I swear, Dave, as you said in your opening, I mean, he loved everyone in this room almost like they were his own children, and he supported us probably all at various times like we were his children. <laughs> and, you know, with, with Fred and his love, it is just uh, something that I'll always remember. I think it's made me a better person and a better father. But then when I think of Fred, I think of that optimistic Fred. And I'm going back to the picture games. I mean, who buys season tickets to the Pacers when half the arena is not even allowed to sell seats? They suck, right? Who goes to the game? And I think it was Fred's way of teaching Dave and his friends about, you know, 
believing in something that's going to happen because they would be down 20 points in the fourth quarter. It's like, we're staying. They're going to come back. <laughs> and we would stay. And you'd see people leaving. And I, I was thinking about this, and I think that was Fred's way of teaching us that when you're going to go after something, you, you can't quit. And, uh, you know, he stuck with the Pacers for God knows how many years, and they finally started to win. Same happened to the Colts. Uh, the man was a loyal man. And uh, when he believed in something, his optimism was just there. Sometimes got the best of him. Uh, another story, and again, I'm always the butt of these jokes, but it's all right. I've heard them so many times, so I'm allowed to tell them. Dave's 21st birthday, and we're in Las Vegas. And where's Bob Alton? I haven't even got to shake Bob's hand, but I hope Bob's here. But Bob and Fred are in Las Vegas. Can you imagine that? It's, it's just, I would do it every day. It was that much fun. And uh, I'm, I'm a junior in college. I have no money to begin with, and I'm broke on this trip already. And we're, we're at a Chinese dinner. We're, Getting, getting our meal, and you know, Fred and Bob are two of the most positive people I've ever met, and they're always excited, and I'm just really, really not in a good mood. <laughs> and we are sitting there, and we're doing dinner, and Bob comes up with this great idea at the end that we were all going to share our fortune cookies. <laughs> so, they start, there's like 15 of us, 20 of us around tables, twice the size of this. And they get to me, and you know, we'd stop and look as David opened his, and he'd read his fortune and lucky numbers on the back. And it gets to me, and I'm no money in my pocket, I'm broke, I'm mad, and I open my cookie, and I kid you not, there's no fortune. <laughs> I, I can't make this up. I mean, as God is my witness, and I think all my friends were there, there was no fortune. <laughs> and, and Fred Scott's just his eternal optimism, and I've reflected on this too, I think it was like, he was playing me. He was trying to act like he, he cared, so he gave me some money to try to go win it back. But what I really come to understand is that he and Bob were just wanting me to get to a different part of the casino because that was the bad luck hanging on their table. And, and I know this because when I came back to their table after I lost that money, Bob looked at me and it's kind of like, move away. <laughs> Fred looked at me and said, you lost it, didn't you, Heidi? I said, maybe you should go to bed. <laughs> so, that eternal optimism did get the, get the best of them sometimes. Um, with regards to Fred's uh, generosity, Gosh, generosity can be measured in so many ways. You know, um, there's, a, there's a song I love, and there's a lyric in there that says, all the rusty signs we ignore along the way, uh, instead focusing on the shiny ones. And, uh, and that was Fred Scott and his generosity. You know, it's easy to be gravitated and attracted to the shiny things in life, but he cared about the folks that didn't maybe have everything. And uh, his contributions to, to Big Brothers and the, what he did for that organization, you know, I'm not just talking from what Dave put in the obituary, I'm talking from sitting in the back seat of his Cadillac hearing him on these conference calls trying to raise money. I mean, I watched that man work and work and work to raise this money for this great cause for kids that just didn't have everything. And I know Fred came from a place where he didn't always have everything. So uh, very inspirational there with regards to how he carried himself and his generosity there. And then I'll close with this. There are a few places where Fred was generous and he didn't realize it. Blockbuster went out of business two years later thanks to his late fees. It was very generous. <laughs> Domino's Pizza on Keystone Avenue, you'd call and give them the phone number, they'd do the address because he fed 30 of us a night. <laughs> Dine it too. And then uh, Drew even put in a, a text the other day, and the amount of Cokes we consumed at your house, <laughs> and the, the bill you spent there, I can't imagine. But there, there's two things that I'm going to miss Fred about when it comes to these little funny generosity deals. I'm convinced you gave him a grocery list once, and it said milk, eggs, bacon, and then it said readers on the bottom. And he never changed the list because he has 15,000 pair of reading glasses. And I swear, every time he goes to the store, he's buying reading glasses, and you're going to find them for about the next 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in the last place, it's only fitting that we're here at Hillcrest because I was talking with uh, Brian Alcower before. And <laughs> I think half of 46250 knew that your account number is 174. <laughs> I still know it, and I'm 43. But now there's, it's not that we came here without money all the time. We came here and they didn't accept money, so that's a help for us problem. But your problem was that I can only imagine the bill. They need to put a plaque on the wall, and they need to put the amount that Fred Scott spent from like 1985 to 1996 on account 174, because it is ridiculous, and that was not golf. That was just poolside, Greek grilled cheese, and uh, coast. So, so with that, uh, I know I've run long here, but Fred has meant so much to me in my life. Um, I miss him dearly. Um, I think about him often. I was able to catch up with him in December. And then the nice thing here is that uh, I was able to share all this with Fred. I knew he wasn't going to live forever, and I knew he was getting sick. So uh, I was able to tell him just how much I loved him. 
And it was nice to hear him say how much he loved me. So with that, I uh, just want to say thanks. Bravo, Rob Hyatt. Okay. Bravo, Craig. Uh, hey, Scott, it's the other Scott. Scott Montross would like to say a few words. That's something my dad used to say to Scott quite a bit. When we call each other on the phone, it would start with, Scott! Scott! <laughs> and then the other person would say, how are you, Scott? You know, we had a great time with that. And uh, I'll say it's, it's, it's really a lot of fun to sit here and think about a man who had this many friends who would all come to celebrate his life and to honor him. It's, it's really something, you know, we should all be so lucky. Of course, it's not luck. He worked at it. Um, by just being himself. I first met Fred um, 25 years ago. I was invited to join a golf group and Fred was part of them. There were eight, well, the guy I was replacing, there were seven in it, but uh, I, I did not know him. I had never met Fred. And they said, well, you and Fred are partners. And you and Fred are staying in this room. You're in the same room. I think you did it, didn't you? Sea Island, was that where it was? Yeah. Jack Gray was in charge of the trip. And um, so they sent me down to the room, and um, there was only one bed in it, and, and Jack said, now there's, there's a smaller room over here off the side. As Fred would later say, it was a room closet. <laughs> but. I was also warned that he snored. <laughs> I mean, if there's ever a guy who's a walking advertisement for CPAP or something. <laughs> I, I was warned that he snored, and I said, you know, I sleep like a rock, don't worry about it. So I just went to sleep, been traveling much of the day to get down to Sea Island. It's not an easy trip, and um, all of a sudden, my God, I hear this noise. It just scares the hell out of me. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> I mean, these windows would rattle, I'm telling you. <laughs> so that, that's, when, that's when the fun began, to learn who Fred Scott was and to spend, you know, another 20 plus years riding in a cart with him, four days a year, and it just went on and on and on. I've never known a person who was more fun, who had a quicker wit than Fred did. And so, I know from being in here, this group is uh, enthusiastic, and I'm going to solicit some group participation. I'm going to give you a model of that. Then you'll, you'll catch on here in a minute. Uh, I used to run a golf tournament, uh, or I ran a golf tournament for a fellow who was a, uh, he made and repaired golf clubs. And he always used to say, you know, if you ever want to throw a golf club, yell, I know Joe. Joe Kearns was the guy's name, and he said, doesn't make any difference if it hits a tree or if it goes in the water or if the head flies off. So I, um, after Joe died, I put together a golf outing for, uh, for him, and we called it the I Know Joe Open. And when it was over with, we told everybody to bring an old golf club. And when it was over with, the plaza where we were having the, uh, the dinner was uh, near a water hazard on the golf course. So I would go up to the edge of the water and what, 100 guys would encircle the water hazard and they all had their clubs. I said, now be careful. So did it go three, two, one? I don't know, whatever it was. We would all fling our golf clubs a hundred guys would yell, I know Joe. <laughs> okay, so now I have a job for the group based on that model. 
There are a zillion stories about Fred, things that he used to say, and um, one of them, and so many of you are familiar with this, uh, if he really crushed a drive, he'd say, well, I got that one in the what? I got that one on the PP. <laughs> so, I don't know if Joe Kern has heard us up there, but my dad always said after he died, he was going to be right there next to Jesus, looking right down at me. And so Fred's up there now, and we know that. And I'd like Fred to hear it, so I'm going to turn to you and say, where did he hit it? Right in the pee -pee. Right in the pee -pee. That's right. Okay, so, so he'd walk off the team, he'd sit down in the car with me, and say, oh, I hit that one right in the pee pee. <laughs> then he'd say something else funny, I'm sure. So... Where did he hit it? Right on the TV. <laughs> so anyway, no, I'm not finished. <laughs> Don't be hopeful. My wife is hopeful I'll be finished. <laughs> she sits back there. She'll give me this. I told her, I said, you know, don't give me any trouble. That's the reason lawyers can't be on juries is because the nominating speeches for foreman take too long. <laughs> so she, that doesn't help too much with her. But, uh, so our group of eight was, uh, it was just a wonderful bunch. And Fred had nicknames for everybody. Um, let's see, Bill Merrill sitting back there was, uh, Bill has the ability to hit a golf ball very hard and often practically every direction, <laughs> which I do too. And um, Fred and I were sitting there talking about some of them, boy, he just strafed that shot out there. And Bill said, Rafer, or no, Fred said, Rafer. And he all, always called Bill Rafer. Let's see, I don't remember what he called him. Oh, Jack's gone. He didn't want to hear what he called him. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jim Poole was a good friend. Jim's a left-handed golfer. I can't duplicate exactly what he would do, but many of you probably remember on the west, far west side of town was a, uh, was a mental hospital <laughs> called the Rue Carter Mental Hospital. <laughs> so our, fr our friend Jim Poole would stand up, put the ball, and if it went around, look at that. Or if he hit a bad shot, he Oh, dang it! Start screaming, not swearing. Jim wouldn't swear. <laughs> so Fred, for 25 years, called him LaRue. <laughs> Bill was Rafer, and he called him LaRue. George Sweet was Jorge, because that's Spanish for George, of course. <laughs> um, oh, and Jack Shaw, who's... Jack's not a real tall guy. Jack, uh, Jack was... Little F. <laughs> you may get that. <laughs> I, I won't go that far, but uh, so there's so many stories about Fred. One of the times on a trip, we were uh, we were playing Greenleaf down in Florida, and Fred and I, of course, were riding together, and I teed off and uh, hit a big slice up into some trees where the group ahead of us was. And they started yelling things at me. And a couple of the guys hopped in the cart and they came roaring back. Fred and I were sitting in the cart and Fred says, all right, big fella. Start driving toward him. He always called me big fella. <laughs> he said, just drive right toward him and stop when I tell you to stop. So I was, I was driving this way, and they were coming this way. And they started to slow down, looking very upset. And Fred said, okay, big fella, stop here. We stopped, I, we stopped about four feet from each other. He said, now get out and stand up real straight. Fool your arms. <laughs> so I went to go like this. And the, guy, the guys looked at each other and said, have a good game. <laughs> He said, did I take care of your partner at that time? Yeah, yeah. You know, this is terrific. I mean, 
you talk about humility. <laughs> Elijah's plate was a great one. David uh, called me a couple of days ago and he shared with me a, uh, uh, a very interesting little letter um, that he found in uh, your dad's drawers. Uh, my son played basketball for North Carolina and, and played under Dean Smith. And so when it was time for me to be in charge of the golf trip, we went to Pinehurst. And um, we were to having dinner at a place called the Holly Inn. Um, and I had invited Coach Smith to come have dinner with us. We played earlier, and uh, he arrived at the Holly Inn, and we went out into a side room, and I introduced him to all the fellows in the group. And uh, Jack Crane, Sam Jack Crane, Jack Shaw, George Sweet, Jim Poole, Tom Rush, Jack Shaw. We have just done the time. And uh, so Dean afterward went over, shook hands with everybody, and so Fred says, you know, everyone in North Carolina, everybody's was always sort of like that to Dean Smith as well. They should be, and I was too. Hell yes, my son played. I didn't know how much he played. And uh, so Fred says, hey Smith, okay. Tell us all those names. <laughs> and darn if he didn't do it. <laughs> so when we played as a group, um, I was playing with Fred and Coach Smith was in, uh, in our group. I thought it'd be fun for everybody to get a feel for Coach Smith, who is the <coughs> ultimate gentleman. Said, other than my father, probably the finest man I ever knew. And we were on the first screen how many of you raise your hands if you know Fred's dog jaw joke? <laughs> you don't know it, do you? <laughs> the funny thing is, you, you, I right back here. You see that depression in my chin? Where a dog got me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to get. Dean Smith is dog jaw joke. <laughs> and then he, he was he was Fred all the way through that. <laughs> he did a job, so um, you know I wrote down a lot of these and I even called a lot of friends of mine. In fact, I had David had some of Fred's friends call me to play golf with him and. Uh, in fact, we did it, uh, I did it last night. Janice and I were having dinner with friends, and somebody said, Surely that means and Fred would all, every time he heard that word, he'd say, Don't call me Shirley. <laughs> but he was, uh, of course, the, um, his putter was Heartbreaker, which he guarded very, very carefully. <laughs> I remember walking off the green with him one time early on in our friendship and I walked over and picked up a flag stick, picked up the flag stick and was going over and put it in the cup and Fred said, how much do you think that flag stick weighs? I said, hell Fred, I don't know. He said, well, of course you don't, you haven't picked it up all day. <laughs> <laughs> So he had so many of these, uh, so many of these remarks he would make. He was playing with them one time, and the people we were playing against, the guy hit a drive right as a pee pee, and Fred said, "I wouldn't hit Mike Tyson that hard." <laughs> when we when we were roommates, he would uh, uh, we had to come in, come out, condominium a few times and. Be walking down the darkened hall, and all of a sudden Freddie come roaring out, ah! just to scare, scare, or startle somebody. And afterwards, when he's shaving, he did things to his face with a razor. I don't know how he did. Is that right? Ah! He does this thing like that, and he would say, "Excuse me." He would say, "Smooth as a baby's." 
I, I mean, it, it hurt me to watch him do that. And, okay, boys, you probably heard this, these words in school. Somebody was saying, um, saying they had played um, golf down in Florida, and um, there was an alligator down by the water hazard near the green, and the story was that this guy wandered over there, and here came the alligator. Fred said, that alligator had come after me, he'd have been sliding and shit. <laughs> come from nowhere. Well, I mean, they came from, you know, really uh, deep and all that. Uh, if he, if things weren't going great, am I getting that? You give me the, the sign. Um, um, he would, um, if he didn't hit a good shot, we'd ride him and he'd say, come on, Freddy! Come on, Fred J, you can do this, you know. Talking to himself, we all do when we're playing golf. But I bet he did this with you, you two down. He'd sing in the golf cart. Did you ever figure that out? I mean, it's not like he had a great voice. <laughs> first thing in the morning, it was like, oh. <laughs> he would break into song. I've, I've been thinking for two weeks if I could just think of the songs he would sing, and he just, he would just burst out in song, he'd be riding in the car or walking on the green or walking off, and he just, he'd just start singing. It was, it was great. He, I, I was at church this morning, and the, the, uh, the sermon was on joy, and I was sitting there, and I thought, your dad brought joy to a lot of people. He was so much fun. He was happy, and um, it was just—it was just—it oh, was always a joy to see him. It was always a joy if it had been sometimes that I saw him, we'd slide into the cart together as partners. It was truly always a joy to see him. My gosh, it was—it was a joy to—it uh, was a joy to listen to him and uh, just enjoy all the stories and all the jokes. Um, Bigger than life, somebody said that, and that was so true. We're all going to miss him, and um, I know he hears that. So, Scott, <laughs> we're going to miss him. He was, he was a great friend and family man. It was all, he, he was on his cell phone all the time on the golf course, but he always muted it. By God, he was on all the time. He was, hey, buddy. <laughs> Can't you, can't you hear his, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a laugh, it was more like a giggle. It really was, it was a giggle. And he always wanted to tell me about, your kids are such great athletes. And he, he said, God, you know, I really think he can do it. I really think he can do it. He's great. In fact, we, we, he was playing in that tournament on a Christmas day, wasn't he? Yeah. We went out there to follow him around and Fred wanted to, <coughs> course do that but he loved his friends and he loved his family we all loved him and um, when you're the great one by opening this up it reminds me of the, of the, the letter from Dean Smith uh, you found for me it's I got off that track didn't I and um, it started out it was on Dean coach Smith's personal secretary personal uh, stationery and it started out and said, Dear Great One, sorry I missed you when you were in Chapel Hill the last time. Um, I'm enclosing a book for you under a separate cover. Well, I guess you don't enclose it under a separate cover. I'm sending you a book on and uh, said something like, Thanks for being the Great One. And, uh, you know, I mean, that was. That, that, was, that was the combination that really hit me, was Coach Smith and, and your dad. 
tried to play dog jaw on him and all that kind of thing. But, uh, and thanks, by the way, for not helping me out. You would have, I should have had you as a plant. <laughs> anyway, I tell you what, it's been a privilege to talk about such a great friend and it's a privilege for all of us to be able to swap stories around about Freddie and uh, we miss everybody when they leave us, but this guy's going to, the great one will leave a big hole. words and as a family it's uh, rewarding to hear all these stories it makes us feel great as we, we haven't heard a lot of those but um, before before our next speaker I'm just gonna cut I had some notes prepared and I'm just gonna I'm gonna since Scott brought it up I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share a couple I wrote a couple of those sayings down myself that Fred said we years Scott maybe you heard a couple of these but uh, when it came to golf, Jack Clark's probably in the room here. So we're playing, well, we're watching golf, we're in the shootout, and one day, we're on the eighth green out here at Hillcrest, and Jack Clark's got a putt, he says this next quote, and my dad looked at me, and, had a, and there must have been 30 people watching, and when Jack says this, everybody starts laughing, and my dad looked at me with this kind of proud grin, and he said, I wonder where he heard that. <laughs> and it wasn't like he was uh, mad at Jack Stoll's quote. It was just like he was honored. You know, it was like, hey, you know, he was paying attention. He listened to that. But he said he'd, he'd look at you. He'd look at the crowd. Somebody's following him in the crowd. And he'd say, Robbie, if I could pick anybody in the entire world to hit this putt, I'd choose me. <laughs> He was playing golf with Bob Knight once. That's uh, he, he played with him a few times, but you know that can be very quite different than playing with Coach Smith. <laughs> so, anyways, they're on the uh, fifth hole of Crooked Stick. It's a long par five, and Knight tops his drive, and he's in this deep rough. And Knight pulls out a seven wood to hit out of this thick rough. First time Fred had ever played golf with him, and he said. Coach, he said, I gotta tell you something. He said, I see you got that seven wood in your hand. He said, that's a he said, that's a thick rough right there. He said, that's a really tough shot. He said, he glared at me and he said, if looks could kill, he said, I'd be dead. <laughs> he said he gripped that seven wood. He said, it was the best shot he hit all day. He said he absolutely pured it. He said, Scott, let me tell you what's tough. Tough's winning the Big Ten with Jab over the pit. <laughs> My dad said, I didn't hesitate. I looked at him and said, Hey son of a bitch, I didn't recruit him, you did. <laughs> We walked into Crooked Stick one day and he ran into a good friend. He said, how are you playing these days? He said, you know, I'm hitting the ball well. He said, I, my, ball, my ball striking is great. He said, but I just, you know, I've been through about three putters in the last two years. He said, I'm doing all these different things. I'm tinkering. He went on and on and on about his putting. And you can tell it's right between the ears. He said, I think I can help you. He said, I, can, I think I can fix you. He said, yeah, what's that? How, Fred, I, what, what, what can I do? He said, well, the way I've always looked at it, I stand over a putt and only two things can happen, one of them's good. And he just walked away. <laughs> this guy looked at me and he said, he's absolutely right. Your dad always has a way of like boiling things down, doesn't he? He's playing, I, I he worked with my dad for 21 years. So I've had a lot of business golf, a lot of work golf with Fred. And I must have heard this. Well, I heard it a lot, let's put it that way. And if we got paired up, Mom, we'd go to, to Hawaii or something, you get somebody random that's playing with you, but a lot of times it'd be, you know, you'd be in an outing or you'd get, you know, in a scramble or something. And you'd get to, say, the 11th hole. And somebody'd look over and they'd say, well, Fred, what do you do for a living? He'd say, I sell life insurance. And they'd say, really? And he'd say, yeah, I've been selling you the last 11 holes, you just didn't know it. <laughs> The other thing they'd say is, you know, they'd ask him, you know, you're in the insurance business. He said, it's either that or go to work. <laughs> but we all knew that was a lie because he worked hard. <coughs> and uh, that's probably about it. But 
I got some other sayings and, and quotes, but they don't relate to golf at that. Um, Scott, thank you for those kind comments. Um, Mike Finley was my dad's roommate his freshman year in college, and gee, it's hard to believe he was his, or at least one of his very best friends to the day he died. Um, Mike, so you come up and say some things. real special honor for me to be here today. I met uh, Fred in uh, September of 1956. We both graduated from high school. We both signed up late to go to college. Uh, I got there first and I see this name on the door. It said Fred J. Scott. And so uh, Fred shows up a little later and I said, we talked a little bit. And the first thing I found out is from Muncie Central. And uh, Muncie Central had uh, beaten my high school out of the semi-state uh, when we were juniors. And, uh, and, but I said, I remember you beat us in the semi-state, but uh, I remember when Milan beat you, he said, 99 times out of 100, we'd have beaten them. <laughs> and so anyway, we, so we had, a lot of, we had a lot of talk about that with Fred. Uh, He's pro probably my best friend, without question. We had a, we had such a great long-term relationship. Started in college. Uh, Fred and I both decided that we would try going to another college for a year after our sophomore year. Fred went to Ball State. I went back to Fort Wayne and went to the the center in Fort Wayne. And then we came back, and then uh, and then uh, he came back with Dinah, and that's when I met Dinah. It was probably about 1958 or nine, something like that. Yeah, more like 1960. Okay. And so, uh, so, so, so then we, uh, so then I finished up at college, and uh, and a year later I moved to California, and uh, another six months after that, friend and Diane came to California, and they called and said we're living in uh, in uh, we just got here, we're living in Santa Monica, and I said well, that's where I live. So they moved about five blocks from us, so we spent the next year together hanging out in California and, and having a great time. And then uh, I think you came back before I did, and then I came back about a year later. And then uh, we kind of lost track of each other again, and then I got a call one day, and Fred said, uh, hey, uh, Mike, want to talk about something? I said, what's that? And he said, did you ever think about buying any life insurance? And I said, yeah, I did. Well, why do you ask? He said, well, I just got into business, and uh, uh, July the July the 14th, and uh, I thought maybe I'd call you and see if I could get together with you. I said, well, I started on July the 16th. <laughs> and, so, and so now we have a connection again, so we, had, we started doing things, and as David alluded, we went to the Million Dollar Round Table a lot of times together, and, and we just had a, a great time through the years. Uh, Fred is, uh, I, you know, David shared something the other day when we were talking. He said, you know, my dad just loved life. And you know, that is the absolute truth. He loved life. He loved people. And he loved his family. And he, 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 he couldn't stop talking about his grandkids. I mean, he just loved his grandkids. Every time I'd seen, particularly in the last, uh, over the last two years, two and a half years, I saw Fred probably at least once a month, maybe twice a month. And uh, every time he'd tell me, a lot of the same stories, actually. <laughs> and uh, but he was very, very proud of all his grandkids, and proud of his family, and proud of Dinah. And we had uh, so much fun together. Uh, he loved his family. He uh, he embraced life, and uh, and I think the uh, the other interesting thing is Fred was a very positive influence in my life. I think if I if, if I could have gone back, I think I'd probably moved to Indianapolis and gone and visited with him. Uh, as it was, I lived in Fort Wayne, which is where my family resided. And uh, so it just didn't make sense to, to move to Indianapolis, but maybe now it might have made more sense. But we did do some, some nice cases together. We did a really nice case with, uh, is Mark still here? Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. 
Okay. Yeah, Mark, yeah. We did a really, really nice case with Mark. I remember the Dimsco case we did. And uh, so we really enjoyed that. I particularly enjoyed going to the Million Dollar Roundtable. I remember, I, I have to tell this one story. When uh, Fred and Diana moved back to Bloomington uh, in, uh, what's the name of those apartments? Ever, ever, Evermont. Evermont Apartments, Marriott Housing. They lived right next door to one of my fraternity brothers. And uh, so I, uh, Fred called and went over to see him. And, and uh, Fred uh, had pulled his, came up in his Studebaker Lark with his uh, trailer full of furniture, um, parked the trailer, got in the Lark and moved the Lark and did an error or something and came back and said, somebody stole my trailer. Well, the trailer rolled all the way down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Never hit anything. <laughs> uh, that was uh, that was Fred, and, and as, as Scott alluded to uh, some of his one-liners. Um, I say, if you've ever played golf with Fred, you've heard a lot of one-liners. If you've ever played golf as much as I have with Fred, you've heard them about a hundred times. <laughs> We would have a match uh, every year for about five years in a row. He came up and played at the Fort Wayne Country Club, and we would play uh, an, an attorney and, uh, and a fellow by the name of Bill Couch. He was an All Big Ten tight end in Indiana, and uh, every single year we would play them. Couch would say, "Fred, this year I'm playing really great. This year I know we're going to beat you." We, beat, we, we killed them every year for five years in a row. Brought them down here to Crooked Stick, beat them down here. But we had a, a great time. I wish I could tell you some of the, some of the things Fred said on those trips, but uh, in, in the light of the, of the children, I won't say that. <laughs> so Fred was uh, a million dollar round table for 49 years. That is just incredible. Uh, I was for 34 years, and uh, we did a lot of those trips together. Uh, we both were in the insurance business two days apart. Uh, I will finish my 54th year in July, and uh, and like Fred, I'm uh, you know they say when are you going to retire? And I said well, most people won't know if I do because we take a lot of time off. My wife Jean retired from her law practice. Wait, Gene, the crowd. <laughs> Retired from the law practice at Christmas, and uh, she's already planned five vacations this year, so uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a banner year for us. I think that Fred, without question, epitomizes the American dream. Fred came from a very, very tough background. And uh, maybe many of you don't know it, and I'm not going to share what I know, but Fred came up the hard way, and he really epitomized what you can do in this country if you really want to do it. And for that, uh, I think uh, David and the family, all the rest of you should be really, really proud of what he's accomplished, because it's pretty phenomenal in the business. Lots and lots of people know Fred. Uh, he's, he was a... Uh, he was a tough guy. I, I think your friend told me two, your friend told me three years ago. Said Mike, uh, and we were down in Florida. And I said uh, he asked me to come down and spend some time. He said, you know, I got a uh, I went saw my doctor, and uh, he said he told me I had two months to two years, and he teared up. And I said, Fred, you know, I they they don't they're not right all the time, and so let's let's just enjoy it. Let's have some fun. And, uh, you know, it was like three and a half years ago. I think he was so tough that he just did not want to give up. And at the end, we saw that. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I came down here to see him in the hospital and said, well, that's it. But it wasn't. So, um, and I really enjoyed coming down because we talked about pretty much everything except his sickness. We talked about things that we did in college and in California and basketball and football and you know just like we go out to dinner a lot and different places to eat and just a wonderful time <coughs> and Fred and what there's another thing in life that Fred really loved and that was Fred really loved to eat <laughs> I mean I can remember going to breakfast with him and eating two breakfasts <laughs>
And and uh, yeah, and Scott, you stole my thunder on uh, on uh, his. I think he called his driver thunder, yeah. and his putter heartbreaker. And he'd tell Bill Couch and say, "I'm getting no heartbreaker out here, so get ready." And, and it, we just it was it was a, a wonderful experience. I wouldn't trade the 61 years that we knew each other for anything. And so it's 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 really a privilege. I don't know very many of you folks here, but. Uh, I know that you know Fred because I can hear your testimony, and he's the same Fred I know. Okay. I hate crowds, so I'm not going to say a whole lot. But I have something for my brother. Um, my dear friend Sally Sumler, her niece, and we enlisted her help. I've known Sally for over 40 years. And uh, anyway, I want to give this to my brother. This is a quilt. Uh -huh. And it's all of dad. It's 25, 25 of the 500 of my dad's <laughs> golf shirts. <laughs> with you, which I think was, what, five straight? One of the things he was tickled about is he'd always bring home a golf shirt for me. Because he went golf shop credit, and he's like, well, I got you another shirt. The man loved golf shirts. Um, and, and his wife, made, mom, made sure those golf shirts were, I mean, they were, they were ironed, and they looked good every single time. And, uh, and, and he loved that, too, mom. Um, next person to speak is my cousin Stacy. Um, before she speaks, very quickly, I just want to set the table and, and say uh, Stacy's mom, my, my Aunt Missy, passed away uh, last year. On and Patty's birthday, on April 7th, or August 17th. On, on, his, okay, on, his, on his brother's birthday. On their brother's birthday, I'm sorry. Um, and, and I will share something with you that, that I shared with her and I shared with the family. But Jackson had a cross country meet that day, and, and Dad worked, he, he would work so hard to get healthy so that he could do these things. And people would come up to me sometimes and say, hey, is your dad, you know, you know, quality of life, and we'd have those kind of conversations. And the way my dad looked at it is, hey, Jackson's got a cross country meet in three weeks, and by God, I'm gonna be there. And he'd do it, he'd be there. And he really wanted to be at Jackson's cross country meet to see it, and Jackson, he did so well, and, uh, and he was proud of you. And a lot of people in this room, I think, were there to, at that same cross-country meeting. They saw that, and they couldn't believe that he showed up because the man was like six months earlier that everybody you know, was sending their condolences and more than they make out of the hospital kind of thing. Um, but we knew that Missy had passed away as a family, but Dad didn't know that yet. And I said, well, I'm going to tell him after cross-country meeting because if I tell him, I know he won't go. And I know how much cross-country meeting meets soon. And so it was just went from his glorious day, of course, and Jackson did so well. To, uh, to going home, and then we looked around the room, and we realized we had to tell Dad that his sister died. And when when it came down to it, I had to tell him that. And that's the hardest thing that I've ever had to do in my life, because I knew how much he loved her. They did come from a very difficult background, and his sister helped raise him. Um, pretty much, you know, did raise him. And uh, I, you know, Mom, you've been with him most of your life, but that day was the most heartbroken I've ever seen my dad. He loved his sister. Um, and he loved his family in Muncie, Indiana. And he made sure that we all knew his family in Muncie, and we went every Christmas and every Thanksgiving, and really special times. And they're all here today, sitting over at the table. Um, but he, he loved them so much. And um, so anyways, 
<laughs> they don't want to get all sappy and everything. And write stuff down for Stacy. Okay. Uh, but he loved he loved his uh, so his Lisa's, that. his three, Stacy, Pam, and Sandy. Wow, wow. Loved them so much, and and played with them. And he said every time I'll, I'll, I'll we'll tell a quick funny story so it's not sappy. He said every time I go to Muncie, Indiana, he said every time I go to my sisters, he said I play with the girls, and he said damn every time I hurt one of them. <laughs> We've been doing something, and then one of them get injured, and he said, it was always like, well, Fred, you did it again. But he said, I kept doing it. Um, so anyway, Stacy, come on up here and talk and share some memories with us, will you? Yeah. childhood, but with the help of Uncle Duke's constant humor and positive attitude, he helped them get through all their given circumstances. Sorry. He was always the sunshine of my mom's life. Every time you would call or come over and visit or even just the, when she would hear his name, she would just smile and light up. There were so many funny stories they would tell me about their childhood, even through the rough times, but Uncle Duke could always somehow make everyone laugh in a given situation, and what I would give to have them here to tell the stories, that I can't remember the details to give them justice, but um, I will always treasure our family's holidays and vacations together. He never failed to bring the fun to everything. He could even make morning dinner fun. He would, I don't know how many times he would ask the waitress if they had lamb. And then he would say, is it bad? <laughs> and it up as he said it. Uh, and it never got old. <laughs> uh, he had a knack of making everyone, every single person feel special. He was the one, he was the one person that would always walk in and just light up the room when he entered it. He was the family's rock, cheerleader, and pillar. I can't thank him enough for all he's done for my mom throughout her whole life, even to the very end. I want to thank him for always respecting me. He would call me when things would go awry, and he would just say, I, will, I, I want to hear it from you, Stace. You know, he, it made me know that he respected me and wanted my opinion on what was going on. Uh, and he would, I just want to thank him for his constant love and support. And I will always, forever, treasure all the wonderful memories with the best uncle, my uncle Duke. Okay, um, so going from family, you know, uh, as we've all mentioned, my, you know, as I've, as I've mentioned, and Rob Hyatt talked about when he was up here um, a little bit ago, my dad took the time. Uh, he didn't want to just like know who my friends were, and he didn't want to just. Uh, I mean, Alex Bance is sitting right here, and, and his son Jack and Jackson are, are uh, really good buddies, and like he would say, "Well, now, now who's Bance's kid, and who's his dad?" And, like he wanted to get to know you guys. You want to know people, that's Fred. Uh, the next person we're going to talk is Jeremy Hamilton, who I met uh, my freshman year in college, and who became a, a good friend, and a good friend of the families, and, um, and is, is a fraternity brother, and is wearing a shiny shirt that he got from Fred Scott from the Daryl <laughs> Willie Invitational, uh, I think maybe in Oklahoma. 
Daryl Royal and Will Nelson. And uh, Jeremy, come on. Let me show your members. Thanks. There's nearly an unlimited number of stories we can tell about Fred Scott, but I've selected just one, and it's a quick one. I met David freshman year at IU. It wasn't long after that that I met Fred and Diana and Heather. And it wasn't long after that that you kind of be, become sucked in to the Scott family, to be part of the group, if you're lucky. And there are lots of us here in this room that were lucky enough to be Scott tag-alongs. So what it meant to be a Scott tag-along is you went to Las Vegas, you had fancy dinners. You went to Vail, Colorado. You did all kinds of things that, frankly, you hadn't done or didn't think you'd ever do, but you were doing it. So one time, back in Bloomington, talking to a friend and a fraternity brother about all the things we'd done on this trip with the Scots, and, and this gentleman says, well, of course you know the truth about Fred, right? And I said, what are you talking about? He's like, the, the real story behind Fred Scott. So well, yeah, he sells insurance. He's a hell of a guy. I said, no, no, no. Fred Scott. Is in the mafia. <laughs> so I immediately call BS. I'm like, no, no, no. He's from Indiana. There aren't anybody in the, the mafia in Indiana. He's like, no, 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 no. I know for a fact, for a fact, Fred Scott's in the mafia. So although I dismissed it, it's one of those things that kind of lingers in your mind a little bit, you know? So fast forward to another event. I'm going to my first Colts game ever with Dave and Fred. So I'm sitting in the back seat of Fred's white BMW 750. We're rolling in style. We get into downtown Indianapolis and we pull up in front of the RCA Dome. And when I mean pull up in front of the RCA Dome, I mean there's the RCA Dome, all the doors where you enter, the steps down to the sidewalk, and then the curb. And we pull up and we park right at that curb. I mean right at the curb. And Fred says, all right boys, we're here. So we all bail out. Instantly, uh, officer of the law says, what in the hell do you think and before you can finish the sentence, Fred turns to face him, and this gentleman says, Oh, Mr. Scott, I'm sorry, we will watch your car, enjoy the game. So I'm going up the steps to my first ever Colts game, and I think to myself, son of a gun, Fred Scott is in the market. I don't believe he was you know, ever a member of the Costa Nostra. And the reason why we had the parking privilege that we did uh, was because of Fred's philanthropy. Not only big brothers, but he spent countless hours and years of his life working hard to raise money, uh, including the sheriff's drill spot, the guys in the motorcycle, and those were the guys that spotted him and took care of his car during that Colts game. Um, so, I'll close by saying I, I learned a lot from Fred Scott. Some of the ones I've enjoyed the most are in business and in life, if you never ask the question, the answer is always no. So ask the question. He also told me to be the guy in the room with a big smile. He told me to enjoy life to its fullest and to give more than you take. So for those reasons, in all my experiences with Fred, I'll miss him. Fred, I love you. Thank you for your time. speak is Kyle Kinnett, and Kyle, you've known my dad an awful long time, um, Fred's grandson, Austin, um, is Kyle's son, and uh, Kyle, come on up here, if you're in the room, right? Go ahead. Scott's asked me to um, ask me if I'd like to say something. I said, of course. Uh, I have nothing prepared. I think that's, that's probably what's best. Um, when I was 22 years old, uh, when I was 22 years old, I had Austin uh, with Heather. And at that time in my life, I certainly was not prepared to be a father. Um, in fact, when uh, Heather found out she was pregnant, 
about three weeks. I told this story the other day. Fred said, uh, you know, you're going to have to tell your parents. I'm like, shh. And he said, just go home, and that one's going to be okay. So I went home. About a week later, Fred said, tell your parents. I'm like, nope. And he said, you know you're going to have to tell your parents. I'm like, ah, I'm getting to it. <laughs> a couple weeks pass. I'm like, you know. Same conversation, I'm laying on the couch in my mom's house and there's Fred on the phone. Uh, Kyle, just call and check to see if you got those blood tests. The doctor's gonna need those. Uh, talk to you later, goodbye. <laughs> so, um, that was his way of kind of pushing me along. <laughs> um, but I will say this, is that I've always called Mrs. Scott, Mrs. Scott, and that's out of uh, respect. Um, I really never knew Fred. As uh, Mr. Scott, it was always Fred and then Freddie. I always had the Y to someone that is a term of endearment. And um, yeah, he taught me how to be a father when my family was falling apart. Um, and I didn't know how to be a father. He, he made that possible for me. Um, but he's Austin's grandfather, or Papa. He kind of looked at it as like my partners and helping me be a father with Austin. And. Um, Trust me, I've been called a lot of things in the Scott house. Kyle's not the only one. <laughs> uh, but it's crazy, you know, how Jackson? 12. 12. I knew David when he was 13, so uh, the influence that Fred had on me in my life was um, spectacular. Um, there was times in my life where I wasn't there for myself and he was there for me and my son. Um, had 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 rough spots, and he was one of the one of the he was like a father to me. Um, I kind of bounced around a little bit, but Fred, I never told Fred I loved him. Fred never told me he loved me. Um, but we were all very close and very good friends. And the last time I went and sat down, I talked to him. I was expecting to see death warmed over, um, just because I heard how bad he was, and I must have caught him on a good day because. We had a great conversation. Uh, he got up and walked across the room because he wanted to show me he could. Um, and you know, it was, it was just a really special conversation. And uh, when it was over, I told him I loved him. He said he loved me, we gave each other a hug. And um, that, was, that was really a special moment for me I'll never forget. Um, you know, I, I will share a little bit about what I said to him there, is that I don't know why he did what he did with me. Um, I was kind of the, the kid on the other side of the tracks. I, I never in my life experienced the things that Fred Scott and the Scott family afforded me to do. Um, but I credit a lot of my success, the little success that I've had to him. He showed me um, what, what can be accomplished because I never knew that that these things were available and possible. So he, he instilled a drive, a work ethic. Uh, when you fail, you get your ass up and try harder. Um, and I let him know that. And that, that was never, those were never words that I had with your father. Um, but that last day I did, I told him, I said, look, in my business, it's in the sports business, and I love the Super Bowl. It's like the biggest thing that we do. And the reason I love it is because Fred took me to a Super Bowl 30 years ago. You know, I said, the thing you gave me wasn't a shirt, it wasn't a book, it wasn't grant, you know, it was that experience. And you didn't even know that you did that for me. And, um, you know, you look around this room, you see all these people here that he's impacted their lives in a lot of ways you'll never know. Um, but I can promise you this. Um, Everybody's life is greater. I know Fred Scott. Uh, he's gone, but he's he's not gone because every time I look at Dave, I see Fred. Uh, <laughs> half the time David talks, he sounds like Fred too. <laughs> but um, look, at the end of the day, what we do for livings, what we do earn our money in these stories, what really matters is family. And um, I love my son more than he will ever know. But I wouldn't be where I am today without him. He wouldn't be where he is without me. And then when the three of us would never have been able to get where we are. And it was never this easy. It was never easy. But Fred made it possible. And um, look, I loved him.
I loved him. I cared deeply for David, Heather, Mrs. Scott. <laughs> and um, we went to dinner for Austin's birthday just last week. And that was the first time that all of us had been together without Fred. And um, it was a great night, special. Um, a lot of laughs. And I just kind of sat back and I thought to myself, this is what it's about. This is what he was trying to accomplish all those years. And uh, I was always kind of like the street dog goes right on doing this, doing that. But, but that's what he wanted. he wanted. He wanted his family to be strong, wanted to be supportive of each other. And um, he was just a great man that I feel very fortunate uh, to have the pleasure of know and I appreciate him and his family. So God bless. speaker here um, in just a second, another good friend of mine, Frank Kelsey, but um, before I do, I, I, you know, I like, uh, as you can tell, following up on some of these comments and some of these stories. The Super Bowl, man, what a great, uh, what a great thing, Kyle, to, to have been to that Super Bowl. By the way, I was really pissed off that he took you to the Scottish Super Bowl. Because, like, that was the greatest Super Bowl ever. It was the Whitney Houston singing the national anthem in 91. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was the closest Super Bowl in history. The Giants win when Norwood goes right. And I was like, really? <laughs> he didn't make me. Like, I could have gone. So the next year he takes me. And, and uh, Heather and, and Dinah and I, we all go. And it's in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's like, you know, negative eight. And it's a blowout. It's like a terrible game. It's like, yeah, yeah. I should have been last year. <laughs> well, only I would complain about which Super Bowl I got to go to. Um, but I think Fred, I count, I had some, some memories back there about the Super Bowl. Fred uh, attended like nine or ten Super Bowls, I think. It's the kind of guy he was, you know? He's like, he'd, he'd look up at me and be like, you know what I'm going to do? Like, we should go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> like, Dad, what are you talking about? You know, like, okay, we're going to the Super Bowl. And that's what we did. We just take off and go to the Super Bowl. Um, Frank, why don't you come up here? Frank and I were roommates senior year at IU, and uh, he got to know Fred in a way where he had to like put up with the phone calls and the voicemails and all that stuff. So I think he's gonna come up and share some, uh, some stories. Frank Kills. I've yet to go to a Super Bowl myself, so uh, that tends a long ways away. Um, I'm glad that others have said some, that they have trouble saying Mr. and Mrs. and saying by the first names. I still call Dinah Mrs. Scott. And actually, uh, Mrs. Hyatt got upset at me tonight because I was calling her Mrs. Hyatt. I've never gotten over that. So while I speak, I might say Fred, I might say Mr. Scott. We're talking about the exact same person. <laughs> And uh, before I get going, I just want to say how enjoyable it is just to see Davey up here telling stories about his dad. First of all, it's the most beautiful thing I think I've ever seen in life. Secondarily, like your sound, just like your father. You <laughs> deliver it exactly the way you know. Still alive in you, and a lot of people in this room. And uh, you know, I came along a little bit later than the rest of the crew. Jeremy and I came, came in in college and a few of us others, but um, there was still a special bond with Mr. Scott. I, uh, unfortunately, you know, Fred passed away on a Monday and I was leaving for a work trip Monday morning and I didn't get back till Friday and I'm flipping out, you know, and uh, saying, well, I'm worried if the funeral's this day, I don't know what I'm gonna do, and if it's that day, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I was talking to my wife on the phone about it, and I'm like, wait a minute, the Scott's moving pretty slow on everything. <laughs> The funeral's gonna be before I get back. I think that was I, I would have had to leave work, put it that way. But um, but I was there uh, all week, you know, as with a lot of our friends who were very close to Fred. I mean, I cried a little bit here and there, and I was telling Dave when I got back, like I'd be upset and I'd be shedding tears, and then I'd think about Fred and I'd smile, because all you could ever do when you thought about Fred Scott was smile. That's the way you made you feel about yourself and as an individual. So I wanted to start tonight by telling a story about college. It's a little bit at Dave's expense, but um, 
as most of you know, David and I were roommates our last year of college, and uh, we lived together in a very small apartment right across the street from Lehman and uh, the party house. We had a quiet little abode across the street, but anyway, um, uh, it was a small place, but it was big enough. There was a little bit of space, and uh, I learned very quickly that Fred and I shared a job that year. That job was making sure that Dave Scott was out of bed. <laughs> so, um, and most of you remember, although there's some younger folks in the room that might not remember, but back in those days, you were at the mercy of the phone company because the phone and the answering machine went where the phone company put it in your place. So what I didn't realize when I was moving in there is that the phone was all the way opposite from Dave's bedroom, but it was right outside my bedroom door. <laughs> so most days I would have to get Dave out of bed for a test, and you know, he would help me out too, don't get me wrong. I had trouble getting out of bed myself when I was that age, but when there were big days, a test, a quiz, something along those lines, Fred Scott would intervene. But Fred didn't call. Dave and I set our schedules up. We had a class from like 12 to 5, but Fred didn't realize this. So if Dave had a test at 2 o'clock, Fred would call at 8.30 in the morning. And I don't know how many people in the room know the whistle, but the voice message would go something like this. David, it's your dad. It's time to wake up. You have a test today. <laughs> This would go on for 60 to 90 seconds. I would be like, the first time I'm laying, I'd be like, what is going on? What is that noise? Uh, the cute thing about the whole deal is I would get up and I'd get Dave out of bed. First time I actually got up and said, hey, Mr. Scott, it's Frank, hold on, I'll get him up. So then I got Dave. But when I would go to wake Dave up, it'd take me like five to 10 minutes. Like, come on, you gotta get up, you gotta go to class. When Fred called, I'd say, hey, Dave, your dad's on the phone. And Dave would wake up, go talk to his dad on the phone, like, like that. And that's the way that relationship was. It was very special. <laughs> but the real thing I want to talk about today, and when I think of Fred Scott, a lot of people talk about a lot of different things, and he was all of that, of course. Um, but uh, the personality trait I think of the most is generosity. And there were, the, there were the games, the concerts, and the dinners, and all that stuff, and that's one form of generosity. But what really resonates with me about Mr. Scott was his generosity with time and attention that he gave to me, and name it, Duncan, Jeremy, Sam, all of us, Justin, so on and so forth. Like, the list goes on and on about, you know, being a backup parent to us and spending time with us and being there for us when we needed uh, when we needed him. When I when I was first out of college, I moved to Chicago and I had a job and I was miserable for seven or eight months. I hated my job. And I finally quit my job and I came home. And I was I was unemployed for a couple months and and I was down. And you know of course I talked to my own dad and some other people about you know what I wanted to do in life and so on and so forth. But Fred offered to spend a little bit of time with me, and I ended up in his office for about an hour and a half one day. And um, you know, I, when you're that age, you don't realize how how valuable people's time is, you know. And, but, but Fred put everything aside. And we just sat and talked. We talked a lot about. He asked me a lot of questions about what I want to do in life. If I could do anything, what would it be? He talked a lot about his life and his career. And you know, he had a few jobs starting out. He went to California back and was very relatable to me. And it was meaningful. It was a very meaningful conversation with someone who didn't have to spend that time that they did. And he put it into a lot of us. And, and, and Fred said a couple things to me that day that have, that have still stuck with me. One of which, and of course he stopped me at the end of the conversation and said, well, let me tell you something, son. If this is the worst problem you have in your entire life, you're gonna be a very, very lucky man. And he was right. He was 110% right. The other thing he said, which is probably the most valuable thing is he just looked at me and said, listen, if you need to talk, if you're down, you can give me a call, you can come into the office. And he really meant it. Like if I would have showed up at his office, he probably would have dropped what he had going on and spent the time with me and listened to me. And that was so valuable. And that's what made Fred Scott such a special person. They didn't call him a great one for no reason. It's because he was an absolutely great person. So. I'd like to offer a toast to great one. You're going to live on with all of us. Here, here.
we've now reached the halfway point. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, Frank, thank you very much for that. Um, we have one more speaker who has uh, one, one more person who'd like to speak that has some prepared comments. Um, we've been talking about all these quotes about Dad, kind of lighten the lighten the mood here. Well, he had a gazillion of them. And I was thinking uh, about some of these things that he used to say off the cuff, or he, as as uh, Mike Finley said, you know, you heard him like six hundred times. And I'll just go with a couple of these real quick before. Uh, Karen Smith, Karen Brown comes up and talks. Um, but a couple of funny things that my dad would hear. I'd hear him say these things so many times. Uh, I see the Scott group over here, Mark Track, Jeannie Shawhan, Craig Koyak, uh, Carolyn Knebley, Big Al. I mean, you guys heard these things too, I'm sure, many times. They'd say, uh, Fred, did I get your uh, date of birth? He'd say 126.38, but I don't act it. <laughs> Didn't matter if he was. Uh, you know, 62, 63, 64 years old, or if he was 74, 75, 76 years old, I mean, this is probably, he had about a 20, 20 year run with this one. And they'd say, Fred, how, you know, I, I look around the room, I saw these familiar faces, but somebody like Jack Potts might say, Fred, how old are you now anyway? And he'd say, I'm a 30 year old man trapped inside a 70 year old man's body. <laughs> Fred was a large man himself, but he had a couple of buddies that were even bigger. And of course, he knew that when he said a joke like this, he was somewhat referencing himself. And he said, "I don't want to be within 100 yards of him when he when he bursts." <laughs> but he'd also, from time to time, ask about somebody. And the irony is, he got so sick at the end of his life. And he always had a sense of humor about it. He knew it. If you guys saw him, you know he knew he was sick. But <laughs> he'd say. Somebody'd say, hey, is, how's he doing anyway? And somebody, a friend, a mutual friend or somebody was sick, and he'd say, well, he's okay. I mean, you know, he died about five years ago, but nobody told him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a couple of the ones I wanted to share with you. Anyway, so Karen, um, the, Karen used to babysit us growing up. She got to know my family quite well. Yeah, I love her. Kind of, well, that's a big job. <laughs> so we had some babysitters equipped. They were up the hills. They were up the hills. Anyways, Karen, uh, you're here. If you'd like to come up, share a few words, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, David. So I learned tonight that there's another babysitter in the room. I don't know if she's in the bar watching NCAA or not, but Marcy Schumann. Yeah. yeah. So we were sort of sisters. Said, and, yeah. David to control the time. <laughs> well, and I didn't even know this till tonight, so it's just yeah. funny. Um, so my name is Karen Smith. I lived back to back in the yard with the Scott family. And I was a freshman in high school in the 80s, and I met the wonderful Scott family. Dinah, Heather, Fred, <coughs> and Scotty, right? Yeah. Right? right? Of course. So I was their babysitter, their house sitter, their dog sitter. I drove the car to get the oil changed, and I loved, it was a Cadillac back then. I didn't get in on the BMW side of the story. I was in the Cadillac era for Fred and for the family. So um, I, I hosted their parties. They would have family parties, friends over, and I would do everything in the kitchen. And do you know, your mother is not even here to hear me tell her that, that I make chicken and rice once a month. Okay, that's probably the meal that I always made the kids. It's easy. It's easy. So um, this family meant a lot to me. And one word that I can come um, that comes to mind when I think of Fred Scott is mentor. So um, I would bring the kids to the pool here at Hillcrest. Didn't know your father belonged to all those other golf courses, and then it dawned on me because they didn't have a pool. <laughs> so you two wanted to be here with the pool. So that's where I brought them. And um, ironically, my son is trying out for Cathedral's high school golf team here tomorrow. So I'm hoping that Fred, the great one, is going to look down and tell him on the back hole where he needs to be and where that ball needs to be. So um, Fred was so happy for me to attend IU. I joined them at many, or he came down and I joined them for many uh, um, IU football tailgates. And of course, who was the other person that said they never went into the game? Robert. Great. I was not a game to go in and watch, right? So, um, had many, many um, great memories of, um, with them. Um, we surrounded that. So, 
I'm thinking about my career, and I had an internship, and I won this sales award, and one day I go into Fred's office, and I say, Fred, I just don't know what to do with my life. Anyone want to guess what he suggested? Life insurance. <laughs> he was my mentor. I looked up to this man for years, and I said, okay, what do I do? So he didn't have the um, team at Many Life to train me, so he sent me over to a company that had that um, capability, and I worked for um, Jim Fitzgerald. Did he make it in? He sits here. And I'm very, very grateful because I met my husband at that company and had Fred not suggested that I go get training with Fitz at the Phoenix, I would have never met my husband who I married 30 years ago, Jeff Brown. So grateful to your dad. So he sent me to the Phoenix Rachel Company. I got all my insurance licenses and exams and I went out on the road and enrolled in a comp, the first gulp group universal life program. My husband, myself, and another gentleman named Tom Butler divided up the United States and we went out for Fred and we enrolled all in a comps, I don't know, 3,000 employees, I'm guessing. And he called me his VP. I'm like, VP of marketing? I just graduated from IU, but I'll take the title. I was grateful, I was grateful. I still had that part. And we were called Benacomp at the time. So I took the southern part of the territory because I knew I could go to the condo and I could stay, right? <laughs> I got, um, I planned the whole, where everybody went, and I went to Miami, and Fred was very, very concerned. He said, I'm not sure about you going to Miami by yourself, so you're going to stay in this hotel, you're going to eat in this restaurant. I mean, I had a strict list of things to follow, to do and not to do. Well, guess how this conversation went? Fred? Yeah. It's Karen? Yeah. Everything okay? Well... I needed to change my flight, and I parked my car in the airport right against the curb, and I went in and changed my flight, and I came out, and the car's gone. Karen, you did what? I said, I've never been to an airport by myself. I didn't know the rules. He goes, okay, just sit there, and I will figure out. From Indianapolis, he figured out where I needed to go, where I needed to go, and how I needed to get a rental car out of a towing company yard somewhere. So that was just the kind of man that he was. I could always call and always rely on him. So um, to make a long story short, um, unfortunately the last time I saw Fred, now I'm going to get emotional, because at my father's funeral, you know, but when he walked in with David, he gave me a big bear hug, and I cried on his shoulder. I truly knew that he cared about me, and um, that mentor was a great word for him. So I just want to say thank you for asking me to speak, because he was great man. So, thank you, Sharon. Um, so, everybody we asked to prepare some remarks has, has talked now. If there's anybody that wants to speak, wants to share a story or something, feel free to. Before you do, though, real quick, I'm going to. You get that real quick. You get that from Fred. Um, of course, you know, I've been telling some stories throughout. I did not prepare a speech. I hope that I'd be able to. Uh, to talk to, uh, about my dad and honor him, and I don't want to do that now. And um, I guess I'll I'll, uh, I'll start. I'll, I'll probably get a little emotional here too, so I hope it don't make you uncomfortable if that happens. But um, we used to go to insurance conventions together, and my dad had this great line that he would say over and over and over again. And every time I heard it, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody else would laugh and think it was great, but he'd say. The people, you know, if they gave me a compliment or whatever, he gave Fred, you know, compliment on, on his son, and he'd say, well, I call him everything he knows. And they'd say, yeah, yeah. He'd say, I mean, I didn't teach him everything I know. I just taught him everything he knows. <laughs> yeah, hardy, hardy, hardy. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Dad. I like 500 times. <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter is he did teach me everything I know. You can do that. Um, no, he taught me, he did teach me everything I know. He, he taught me um, how to be a husband, which from time to time I can be a decent husband, right? <laughs> he taught me how to be a father to Jackson and Georgia, uh, who, whom he loves so dearly, but I'd like to think I, uh, I'm living up to his standards with that. He taught me how to be a friend. 
Um, man, that's that's emotional for me because I got so many great friends. You go through something like this, you don't know who you're going to hear from or how they're going to react, but you know they care so much, and I know that. They know how much I care about them, and, and how much my dad cared about them. And so he taught me how to be a friend. He taught me how to be a son. And I think I was a pretty good son. Uh, he taught me how to be a brother. How many times he'd look at me and, and uh, say that, you know, give me advice, and, you know, you gotta do this. Um, he taught me uh, how to be a nephew. He taught me how to be a grandson. He taught me how to be an uncle to Austin. Um, and Ollie. And Ollie, sorry, buddy. Um, but going back to the time when I was a pretty young man, I thought, man, I'm going to go to high school, senior year, and what are people going to be saying and stuff? And he's like, you hold your head high, that's what you're going to do. And this is the best thing that's ever happened in this family, and by God it was. Um, and that was his attitude. Um, and the remarkable thing about this, you guys, as has been alluded to today, and, and you know, I wrote this obituary, and um, I had some input from the family, of course, and had a lot of help with that, but I, mean, I didn't write it, he wrote it. Um, is that he taught me all these things, yet nobody taught him. You know, he didn't have, he had a father, you know, he had a dad, but he really didn't have, a, you know, a president, a father figure presence in his life. He you know, kind of did, from, you know, and Bob Will Hoyt, mom, kind of, you know, instilled in him some tough love and whatnot. And Fred sought out mentors in his life. Um, and he found a lot of mentors in his life. And they shaped him into the person he became. And boy, was he aware of that, and grateful for that. And so he understood that that's like a, a big responsibility. If people are going to do the things for him that they did to, to help shape him and give him opportunity, he knew that he was given opportunity and that he took the opportunity. Nothing was given to him in life, but he took that. He took it very seriously, but by God, he had to give back. And, um, you know, Kyle, you made a comment about, you know, what somebody may see in you or um, a lot of people, Frank Kelsey saying, you know, you take the time and... I mean, there were times where people come into our office and I say, Dad, we don't have time. You know, you just don't have the time to meet with them. He said, well, clear my schedule, because I do. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Dave, you don't understand. You don't know what it's like to be there. And he said, I do. He said, I've been there. And, uh, you know, I got time to meet with him. So I'm going to help him out, because I can. It was a responsibility that he understood. He took seriously. It mattered to him. And, um, and I think that is his legacy, you know? And I guess that's the way I look at it, at least. Um, so there's so many cool stories. Um, I got random notes here. This is going to be a completely random uh, part of my comments section here. And then I, I found a speech that my dad wrote uh, on these note cards here probably 20, 25 years ago. I don't know. And, uh, and I started reading through them. I'm like, I'm going to share some of these with, the, with people too because I think it's so cool. It speaks to who he is. Um, I went in their notes, so it's not like the speech, right? Like if he was here, it'd be great speech. Um, but a couple random thoughts that I just wrote down, I thought I'm going to somehow incorporate these eloquently into a speech while I'm not. I'm just going to share them with you. Is um, that are important to me. You know, Fred was always, you know, he played basketball at Muncie Central. They played against Milan, blah, 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 blah. He, he didn't even think about that game until they made that movie. And he always was tickled by it that other people found it um, interesting because he's like, geez, people are playing like varsity basketball at IU. People are like more interested in talking to me about some stupid movie, which by the way, why does everybody care about that movie? Because, you know, we were supposed to win that game. Who cares? You know, does anybody care about the big team that was supposed to win and they didn't win? Like, what about us, right? I've seen that damn movie in Italy. I've seen that movie on cruise ships. I mean, who cares about that movie? He watched it once. One time. I played blackjack against the actor that played Bobby or uh, played Jimmy Chitlin in Las Vegas, and I'm like, dude, my dad was like on that team. I was like, how does that happen? We ended up the same blackjack table in Vegas, right? Um, but given that aspect of his life, my dad could dunk. I think everybody should know that because he was proud of that. <laughs> um, how could he dunk? Well, he was so proud because he had a long reach, and he would tell anybody that would listen that he could jump his height. He could walk underneath the you know high jump bar and then he could jump and he'd show off and do that. Pretty remarkable. He was a natural athlete. He played baseball. They got busted in the in the nose, Jackson. I don't know if you're aware of this, but he had a uh, Jamestown, Indiana. It's a tiny little town, and he had a good friend, Joe Bob McKay, that was the that led Purdue all time historically still in the wooden bat era and batting average. He played major league baseball. Was a catcher. Caught Whitey Ford's no, no hitter. 
pretty cool stuff. And, and Joe Bob came uh, two years ago to watch Jackson play, which is pretty neat. But he was a great baseball player until that happened. Picked up golf his ninth, uh, when he was in the ninth grade. By senior year, he was a scratch. Go figure that, right? Played a lot of racquetball, Jim Curtis, and squash, and went to the athletic club. But, um, and he was naturally drawn to athletics. He liked to play athletics. He liked to watch his family play athletics. We just liked to, to watch athletics in general. He was, a lot of us can relate to that. Um, my dad stuck up for himself. Um, when he got to Muncie, Indiana, he told me a story a couple of different times about how he was the new kid and everybody was going, you know, he, he, had to, he had to face some adversity there as being the new kid in town. And he said, I was playing a pickup game in Muncie, Indiana, and he said that this guy that was on the varsity basketball team, Muncie Central, he said he's huge. And he sounded a pretty big kid at the time. He's 5'7 or something like that as, as a ninth grader. But he said, we're playing. He said, this guy comes across the 10-second line, I stole the ball from him. And he said he couldn't believe it. Who the hell is this kid think he is? He said he came across the 10-second line. This is on like an outdoor blacktop. He said, I stole the ball from him again. Went in for a layup. He said, this guy was just like, who the hell does this kid think he is? He came across the 10-second line the next time. And he said, he took that basketball and he threw it right in my face, like a baseball, and hit me right in the... And he said, I, I just laid into this guy. And he said, he beat the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, I wasn't going to let him do that to me. And everybody had a black top. And he said, after he beat me up, he said, hey, no, hey, I respect the fact that you came back at me. Another guy that was, uh, that was also on the team um, came to him and my dad said, I went to like five and nine or something. I don't know. Um, and I said, I guess, you know, like the soda shop or whatever. And he said, I got a bad part of candy. And he said, this guy comes up to me and says, give me that candy, Scott. He said, I'm not giving you my candy. He said, I said, give me that bag of candy. He said, I'm not giving you my candy. You can say it all you want. He said, if you don't give me that candy, I'm going to beat the hell out of you. He said, you can beat the tar out of me. And he said, you will. But he said, you're not getting my candy. And he said, if you want to fight me, you're going to lose one of your eyes or you're going to lose one of your something else. And he said, I will hurt you. And he said, he looked at me and he thought better. And he said, fine, keep the candy. And he said, he never messed with me again. It was John Castro, okay, starting the same There you go. So he knew how to stuck up for himself. He was a, a fantastic person. He was this huge heart, but he certainly knew how to stand up for himself. Um, my couple and I have talked about uh, how, to, how do you break 70. I've been broke 70 in my life. I'm trying. I'm still trying. But he told me the last time he broke 70 on the golf course, he eagled the 18 told Meridian Hills to shoot a 69. And then in the Diddle Cup, he was old. And, uh, but he was proud, and he, uh, he shot 70 in competition against the club champ at Highland. I mean, that was, what, 15 years ago or something? I mean, it was like 65 or something. And I just, I'll never forget, I called him out. He was so proud of that. He had, a, he had a putt to shoot 79, or 69, and he said, I gotta admit, Dave, he said, I lagged it so I could make sure I was one under. <laughs> but, he, but he shot 70. I called him up, and he was with a whole bunch of family friends at some event. <laughs> and I was just calling him to say, like, hey, you know, how about that Randy shot today? I didn't realize it was all these friends. And Jan Houston, I could hear in the background. And, and he answers the phone. He goes, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, what's that? And I was like, Dad, it's Dave. He says, yeah, no, 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 I'm sorry. What did you need? And I said, Dad, it's David. And he goes, yeah, no, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm happy. I can give you, I'm with some friends right now, but if you want to get, guys, I'm sorry, it's USA Today. They need to know about that Randy shot today. <laughs> so we're like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm went on for like 30 seconds, right? He's like, yeah, I had that putt on 18, and I could hear people cackling in the background. And I just thought of it right off like that. How does the guy do that? <laughs> it's unbelievable. His, uh, his passion for life is like unlike anything I've ever seen, and so many people have expressed that, but Heather and I used to joke that we'd go out to dinner with him all the time, and, 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 or you'd be at lunch or something, and he'd say, hey, you got to taste the steak. And he'd say, what? You'd be a dinner. He'd say, you got to taste the steak. I'd say, what? You know, what's, what's the deal? He said, I'm telling you, this is the best guy to steak I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I'm like, God, he said that last month. He said, I mean, once a month, this dude had the best steak that he'd ever had in his life. The best pieces. I mean, and he believed it. And we jumped, like, what a way to go through life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not happy. Leave the steak. That's the best thing I've ever had in my life. Okay? Yeah, why you know, yeah, drink it sure is worth it. How do you feel this morning? Um, I said, I all the time. And then we didn't taste the steak, he'd shoot right back. And he said, okay, don't taste it, that's fine. I mean, it's the only best ice cream or best steak I've ever had in my life. But if you don't want to taste it, you know, fine, just don't taste it. All right, Dad, fine, let me bite you. Let me bite you. Is that right, Austin? Is that right? I think that's so
Um, so, you know, we, we, we've talked about that. Mike, I appreciate you saying what you said about um, his background. And yeah, there are a lot of details. And, and my cousins and, and Muncie, and they know that. It was kind of like the American dream. What a perfectly eloquent uh, way to, to put that. I've been thinking about that the last few days and about, you know, how, how does somebody, you know, do that? How does somebody um, achieve the things he achieved, not just, you know, in business or, or whatever, but just like as a person? How do you come out of a, a tough background where, you know, you just don't have um, much leadership in your life and, just, and end up like he did? And it is. It's he. He saw opportunity. He took it. Um, it was kind of like the American, the American dream. He represented that he was able to do that. And I mean, I got like this a caddy button over here from for people that are that are understand golf. If you if you caddy for a certain number of you know years, and you achieve that status. You're an a caddy. We're a cricket stick. Like last June or July, no, August. I think it was August. Got a, he just got out of the hospital. We go over there. And he sees Ike, and Ike's got his A caddy button. He says, hey, Ike, Ike you, got, you know, got an A caddy button there, huh? He's kind of surprised. He says, yeah, Mr. Scott, I do. I'm surprised you recognize that. He said, well, you're looking at the first A caddy in the state of Indiana. And I was like, what? <laughs> I've never heard that before. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. He's in the golf cart. He's like, take me around. But, you know, let's go. And I was like, well, can you share the story? Like, at least tell me how that happened. Because that was no big deal. He said, they didn't have an A caddy program until my senior year in high school. It just happened to be, like, the guy. He's like, well, that's a pretty cool story, you know? And I'm glad that I, that I learned it that day. Um, but that, you know, he did work hard and he did take a W every single time he did because he knew he would make more money. And um, that work ethic stuck with him his entire life. He, 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 he believed um, that he could outwork his, his competitors. I think people here at the Scott Group understood that. They saw how tenacious Carolyn, when, when you came in, we talked a little bit about the fact that you got to see behind the scenes and you worked with Fred when, when he was in his prime. And, um, you know, he'd stay there till 11 p.m., 12 a.m., whatever it took to make sure he was prepared. And he was not going to lose a case because he wasn't prepared or he wasn't working hard enough. He knew that. Um, and, and of course, my dad instilled that in me. And it's pretty cool stuff. But uh, I found a speech of his uh, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. And like every single one of these note cards, it's just about being positive and optimistic and having desire and, and everything else. And of course, I'm not going to give the entire speech. Um, I wish I had it on, on tape or something, but a few things I'll, I'll share with you uh, from this that sound a lot like Fred Scott, right, is, you know, he, he didn't live his life in the rearview mirror. Everything you see on these tables, um, that are in these frames, these, these pictures, these mementos, all this stuff, was in, like, shoeboxes uh, two weeks ago when he died. So we went out and had him framed, and... You know, I, I, you know, he just didn't, he just didn't look like, you know, in the past. He always looked for tomorrow. He looked at the present. He believed in that. Um, and he says right here on this note card, he started his speech, is the only way to grow is to accept change. And he would talk to me about that all the time. It's like, you have to accept change. I mean, you have to, you, you know, it drove him crazy when people say, well, Fred, we can't do that. Well, why can't you do that? Because, you know, we've done, we've never done it that way. He's like, what are you talking about? And it would drive him nuts. Most people fail because they lose sight of the giving principle of life is the next column in this card. The more you help others, the greater your own success will be. Number two, the more love and support you give, the more you'll get back. Sound like Fred? Uh, number three, the more you focus on helping people through your business, the bigger your business will grow. He believed that, hence the Big Brothers. He said, I never got involved with Big Brothers because I, I wanted uh, something out of business, but as a result of it, uh, it just happened to be that I got a lot of business out of those uh, relationships. The very next note card, he looked around. I can see him doing it right now. He said, you know, there's a lot of ugly people in the room. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to point you out. <laughs> and then he probably told a story or something. Like that. Um, this next note card, he said, and he highlighted it on this, this one phrase. He says, others don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that's pretty pretty accurate. Um, <coughs> believe in yourself again. And he wrote that and he underlined again twice. Dream again. Believe you're special again. See yourself winning again. Believe you're special. That you're different again. He told me that a lot. Talked about the future and how he's, I think this was a Big Brother speech maybe because he talks about you know, a young boy and 
and things like that. But he said, Maxwell Mars, Maxwell Maltz wrote, life will give you whatever you accept, and life will turn out the way you see it turning out. And I think my dad accepted only the positive things in life, and he saw his life turning out well. And so it did. And by God, we saw how many times where he'd be like, well, we're just, you know, it's just ain't gonna happen because well, I'll overcome it somehow or another. You have determination. Um, the greatest secret in the world. God, he loved the Ogmandino book. Tell me if this sounds like this guy. He said, Dick Gottler, I think it was Dick Gottler, he gave him the book by Ogmandino, the greatest uh, salesman in the world. And he said, I started reading it. And he said, I was leaving Cincinnati, Ohio. And he said, I was just kind of glancing at it as I was driving. And quickly I realized I couldn't do this. So he said, I pulled over to the side of the road, halfway home from Cincinnati, put my blinkers on in the shoulder, and I read the entire book. And he said, I was so inspired. <laughs> that was our passion. Um, but Automandino wrote, and, he, and my dad gra gravitated toward it, the greatest secret in the world was uh, just being a little bit better than everybody else. And it got to be a lot better. You gotta be a little, Dave, you know, you gotta try harder than everybody else, and if you can just be a little bit better. And he believed in that, and, and he thought he could achieve that. Um, another note card about desire, and, and of course, if we know he had desire. Final word about criticism, don't. I rarely saw my dad criticize anybody. He said, you need to be a master motivator. Praise people for everything is number one. Number two, Know their first name and use it. Number three, let everybody hear your praise. And you know, throughout my life, he always let everybody hear him praise me. And I think everybody else. There's a lot of people in this room. He just right in front of everybody. In the whole room, he'd walk up and he'd see Jack Clark and say, Jack, I'm so proud of you. And he'd have to say it loud enough so everybody could hear it. Yeah. Number four, have fun with praise. I think I just described that. Uh, number five, use praise to get results. Number six, praise people when they're down and hurting. I always wonder, why is everybody coming to my dad's office? <laughs> when they're like down on their luck. Like, what's the deal here? I was like, and I quickly realized because if you sat on the other side of the desk and Fred was looking at you and he said, hey, buddy, everything's going to be okay. It's not as bad as you think. Everything's going to be all right. It's just calm down. Just take, you know, it's going to be okay. And you walk out and you believe them. He, he, he made you feel that way. Uh, number seven, praise must be sincere. Number eight, praise at home, which he often did. And number nine, don't stop praising. I think my dad believes in praise. Uh, this next no card's funny because it says no free, there is no free lunch. I hope everybody here got a free lunch. <laughs> so one right about everything. Uh, he talked about, here's a quote, must be from Thomas Edison, I guess. Opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. My dad wasn't afraid to work. He said, you're going to beat 50% of the people by working hard. You're going to beat another 40% by being honest and standing for something. And the last 10% is a dogfight. But he said, you can't work too hard. You can work too hard, but not too smart. And then he alluded to the great Bear Bryant by saying, Bear Bryant did not coach football, he coached people. I'd like to think that my dad coached a lot of people. When I went to work with him in the insurance business, after about two years, I thought, what the hell's going on? I'm not getting any training, he's not teaching me. I know, I fell an application. <laughs> but he taught me, he, he, was, he, he was doing just that, right? I mean, he was, he was coaching me as a person, and he knew that I'd figure out those other things. Be positive, he writes. You can do 99% of things right and fail if you don't have a positive attitude. Number two, be excited. He was always excited. My dad had such enthusiasm and such passion. Number three, there are no excuses. And very rarely would I hear my dad offer up an excuse. And if I started, you know, giving him excuses, he'd listen and listen and listen and listen. And he'd be like, all right, you know, I've listened to you. And, I, you know, that's great and everything. But now it's time to, you know, it's time to buckle up. Number four, life is 10% of what you make it and 90% of how you take it. My dad took a lot. He was always happy. He was always smiling. And number five is, and I said this earlier, 99%, I, I just hear him saying this because he said it to me so many times and I found on this note card and thought, geez, okay. But he said, Dave, 99% of things you're worrying about are never going to happen anyway. Isn't that true? 
Yeah. <laughs> have fundamentals. And he talks about a whole bunch of things. He ends up with uh, treat people good and never give up. Create a purpose in life. Commit to something big. Be yourself and create little successes. Next note card reads, treat people good. He said, nobody needs a boss. Everybody needs a leader. He's my leader. Genuine praise is one of the strongest forms of motivation. People will turn out the way you expect them to turn out. The underlined expect them to turn out. He always expected everybody to do well, right? I and mean, if you talk to him, he always expected the best of people. Number four, praise in public. Number five, a great leader always gives his people credit for his success. And man, how many times I see my dad defer his own success. He would probably laugh at all this stuff. <laughs> you know, he'd be like, what the hell? He, he was great about tapping himself and showing them, hey, the party can start now, the great one's here. <laughs> but, you know, the reality was he was very uncomfortable. People praised him. He enjoyed giving praise. He, he had a tougher time taking it because he just felt like he was a pretty ordinary guy. Um, and then he closed with never give up. Quitting is easy. He wrote about success that most people are afraid to succeed. He said you should never get used to reject or never get used to rejection. Things are never as good or as bad as they seem. I talked to Anne about that this morning. You know, we woke up and we knew that this was a big day. We had some very kind text messages from people and a lot of support. And I had this, and I read this last night, and it broke me up when I read through it. I had this speech and I thought, I'll incorporate a couple of things, and then I read the whole thing. And man, it was like whew, hit me. And, um, but I, I instantly, I didn't have to look at a note card. I'm, I'm talking to Ann, and we're like, this is probably going to be a tough day today. And then it's like, why are we worrying about it? And as my dad would say, things are never as good or as bad as they seem. And the last thing he wrote in this uh, card, which is so appropriate, um, is that winners are not born. You know, my dad didn't have indoor plumbing until he was like in the, what, sixth, seventh grade or something? 16 years old. Um, Eighth grade, yeah, and he he was so tickled that his life turned out the way it did because he had no expectation of that and nobody expected it of him. And I, I don't know how it happened. Um, he, he, yeah, because of him. I'm just saying because of him. And he had a determination. He he was happy. I think he was just kind of like born that way. I guess um, that he was born happy, but he. Um, he would look back on his life when he would reflect, and he didn't do that very often, but with me towards the end, sometimes he would. And it was almost like, this was a big dream. And how I went from where I was to where I got, to go see Jackson Scott play uh, golf at Crooked Stick, to see Georgia, little Georgia, just you know strike a, a ball, to see Ollie, do the things that Ollie's did. He, he would look around and it was like, you know, what's going on here? Like, how did this happen, you know? He used to drive to the Crooked Stick, when it was a nine-hole golf course, and park off the side of the road, pop the trunk, get his clubs, and sneak on the golf course and play. <laughs> and then, like, ten years later, he's a member. He's like, what the hell? How'd that happen? I mean, it's like that old, what, WC Fields? Do I want to be a member of a club that would have me? Um, but there he was. And then pretty soon, you know, he's a member of four golf clubs, and, and, and he'd say, well, Dad, what doesn't make a lot of sense? Why do you join another golf club? And he's like, oh, you know, these great guys at Sagamore, and they're just, hell, that's cool. I mean, they're so much fun to be with, and he just loved people. He was enthusiastic about people. He believed in people. He believed in himself, but he believed in others. He always saw the good in the person. And if somebody did something bad, I couldn't, I mean, I just can't tell you how many times he would look at me and say, well, that's, you know, they're not a bad person. That's a good person who did something bad. He just always saw um, the good in people. Um, he saw the good in me. He believed in me. Um, I think it was like six, seven, eight. I was around Thanksgiving or something, and, and Mom gave me a book for uh, Father's Day once, and it was like these quotes by coaches and stuff. And, but one of them stuck with me. Jim Valvano, the great NC State coach, um, gave a speech at the Million Dollar Roundtable. And my dad actually ordered the videotape and like played it for me when I was a kid. It's like, it's unbelievable, you gotta see the speech. And Belmont, man, did he speak? We've all seen the cancer speech. 
you know, I'll never give up. But he, uh, in that speech with Million Dollar, million dollar Roundtable, maybe for the one for, for ESPN, I don't know, he said, my father gave me the greatest gift that any human being could give another human being. He believed in me. And boy, is that true. My dad believed in me, and I knew it every day of my life. He believed in Heather. He believed in Dinah, he believed in Austin, he believed in Holly, he believed in Jackson, he believed in Georgia, and I think he believed in just about everybody in this room, and that's, I think, what made him so special, at least part of what made him so special. Um, he reflected and knew he was lucky to have 80 great years on this planet. It's painful that he is no longer with us, but what a ride it was. I'm going to miss him every day, but he's with me every day, he's with all of us every day. I think his grandkids know how much he cared about them and how much he loved them. I think everybody at the Scott group uh, knew that you were his family. And that, you know, if he couldn't cash, if, if, if payrolls couldn't be met and he couldn't cash a paycheck, by God, you were cashing yours. Um, Robbie, thanks for the comments, but every one of my friends that's here, uh, thank you. Heather, he believed in you every day of your life. Ollie, he just loved you to death. Austin, he, he believed in you so much. Um, and so, I guess at, at this point, again, if there's somebody who wants to say something, it's kind of a tough act to follow, right? But, <laughs> and, I, didn't, I didn't write a speech, I just, you know, decided to talk. Yeah, right? Um, but aren't we doing what Fred would, would want us to do? Yes. Austin wants to say yes. something. So, with that, thank you for listening to that. I might have my face. Austin is going to say something now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. On behalf of my grandpa or my papa, I'd just like to say thank you for coming out. It means the world to the whole family. It means the world to him, too. Uh, I know he's with us here in this room. Growing up as the grandson of the Great One was pretty similar to that of an Arabian prince. I mean, right. <laughs> you had everything you needed when you wanted it. There wasn't really ever a bad time with Papa. I mean, he was the greatest grandpa a kid could ever ask for. I mean, it was a dream come true. Uh, a couple things he did teach me that were very important, I'll make this quick, is to greet every day with love in your heart and to never give up. I mean, no matter how bad things seem, whatever you're going through, never ever give up. He never gave up on me even when I was at my worst. And uh, I'm gonna miss him every day. I'm gonna always miss him, always miss his hugs, but uh, I always know he's gonna be with me on every adventure to come. He's with me right now. And uh, he'd probably want me to tell all of you that he loved you, so. I know you're here with us today. I love you most. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a good day. Okay, Jack, you want to come up here? So, again, we have, uh, by the way, if you want to use the bathroom, if you want to use the drink, feel free. You know, it's like fine. But, uh, yeah. and, and Jack doesn't need the microphone, so. This might be the first time that I get awarded between Dinah and Fred. Nobody gets awarded before they do, I promise you that. Um, I just want to say a couple of quick things, uh, how important they were to my life, uh, and my family, their friends. David asked me if I would talk, and I said I'm not, not sure if I could handle that because of the emotional ties with our families growing up and, and the special times that all the friends that Dinah and Fred have. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm going to tell a little quick story at the end of Golf Story. That, you know, they said, "Can you think of some things?" And I could think of a million things, but I was thinking of one in general. Um, I joined here back in 1990 at Hillcrest when I was 20 years old or so. So um, crazy enough. And you know, it was Mr. Scott and Mrs. Scott and the group of my parents and you know, all the kids got together with everybody every weekend and. You know, Friday and Saturday night, we would have the babysitters and everybody would go out. Finally got old enough that uh, it was Fred to me. And I'd almost be afraid to pick up the phone and call him because he's always trying to sell me something. <laughs> Just like David, David, what's going on? Hey, I got this new product. Can you come in tomorrow? I mean, so 
we're playing on Hillcrest on number one. Like, you know, we're against each other. Tee off. He hits it to the right, almost out of bounds by the driving range. He's over there taking a leak. I'm like, Fred, what the heck? You didn't know you're taking a leak? It's the first freaking hole. He goes, Jack, come on over here. Get over here. I'm on the other side of the tee box. I'm on the other side of the, uh, you know, the uh, fairway. So what the hell do you need, Freddie? What's going on? He said, do me a favor, Jack. I said, what's that, Freddie? He goes, can you take a peek at this and tell me what it looks like? I haven't seen it in like five years. <laughs> I said, oh my God. <laughs> then he proceeds to hit it in the left bunker. He goes, Jack, I'm the best bunker player you've ever seen in your life. I said, come on, Freddie, talk to me. He proceeds to make it, okay? I said, holy shit. He is the one that, okay, so we get to number two. He hits in the left bunker. He goes, Jack, watch this. I'm going to hit this sucker in two. He drains it. I mean, no kidding. Two out of two. I said, you are the best bunker player I've ever seen in my life. Right? <laughs> um, but here and over there, uh, Dave, I want to say one thing to you. Your dad would be really proud. Yeah. Did an amazing job. You're strong. Strong for your family. Uh, look, right? Stay strong. He's up there looking down on you. He's up there with your mom and dad. Yep. So, I'm proud of your whole family. You guys have handled this amazingly. You're strong as can be. Uh, Fred will be looking down for that. So, cheers, cheers to Fred. off the cuff and anybody that knows me knows that <laughs> knows that number one I can be very worthy so I'll try not to. I'll try not to get off track which I sometimes go completely off track and I forget what I was talking about I want first of all to thank everyone who's here for coming today because it's wonderful. Fred would have loved it. He said, have a party. And that's what we've tried to do, is have a party. And he didn't want some sad scenario, anything like that. And so I thank you all for being here. It means a lot to all of our family that you have done this for us that you have done it for him in his memory. And I'm only going to tell one little story with a tiny addendum at the end. I've been asked many times, well, how did you and Fred meet? Well, the bottom line is that we met in high school. 1954 in the fall and we both got out of different cars next to each other at the same time newcastle indiana he was from muncie i was from the little town in the town. we were going to crash the foot the, the the dance after the muncie central newcastle football game we never made it there my car and his car all wound up out at the local drive-in. <laughs> we got out of the car and we looked at each other and said, hi. I said, hi. My name's Dinah. You know, I'm Fred. I said, what grade are you in? <laughs> he very quickly said, well, what grade are you in? I said, I'm a senior. He said, me too. <laughs> Oh, okay. So, we had two or three dates. The drive, of course, from Muncie back in the day was at least an hour. And so, I unfortunately broke a date with him. And uh, that was the end of that. Of course, my best friend from Nightstown had to call every Scott in the phone book before she called Muncie Central because he lived with his stepdad and mom and the last name wasn't Scott. Believe it or not, when she said to the secretary who answered the phone, 
that she was trying to get a hold of a fellow named Fred Scott. Did she happen to know who that might be? Hey, if you played basketball at Munsey Central, they knew who you were in the 1950s. Trust me. You didn't have to be a star. You were just on the team. She went and got it. He came to the phone. My friend broke the date. I never heard from him again, never saw him again. Except the next year, out of boredom, I am at a friend's house and we are watching the Muncie sectional. And Muncie Central is playing. And they said, and going into the game now is Fred Scott. I said, well, he can't be. He graduated. <laughs> okay. So, now, it is New Year's Eve, 1957. I'm going to Ball State. He's going to IU. But he has good friends who are sorority sisters of mine. And there's a party at their house. And I am there with Date. And actually we were with another couple who, it was her first year of teaching at Muncie Central. And just as she was getting ready to take a sip of her beer, this girl came up and said, hi, Mrs. Sunderman. And it was one of her students. <laughs> So we went from the basement up to the living room. And we're sitting there, trying to figure out what the heck we're going to do. And my sorority sister came upstairs and she said, uh, Dinah, I don't mean to interrupt or anything, but she said, uh, there's a fellow downstairs who thinks he used to know you. And I said, what? She said, yeah, there's a fellow downstairs who says he, he thinks he used to know you about three years ago or so. I'm looking at her like, huh? And she said, well, do you remember a guy named Fred Scott? I said, oh my God. <laughs> and I looked at my date, whom I'd been dating off and on for about two years, and I said, uh, he said he'd like to say hello. I looked at Brad and I said, well, Brad, that's up to you, well, I mean, whatever. And he knew me, knew me well enough to think, well, this is no big deal. So he said, sure, I said, okay, I'll be back in five minutes. Fred Scott was standing at the bottom of the steps. He was wearing a light gray cable knit sweater and dark gray wool flannel pants. I don't know she was wearing, but anyway. And I took one look as I'm walking down the stairs and I thought, boy, you've changed. <laughs> about half an hour later, there was Brad at the top of the steps with one of Fred's good friends and everything, and also Brad's fraternity brother at the top of the stairs. He very, very, uh, what do I want to say? He was very nervous. And he said, uh, um, uh, Brad, I'd like for you to meet Fred Scott. And uh, Fred, this is, is Brad Neal. Hi, hi. And then Brad looked at me and he said, uh, young lady. Brad was six years older. He was a veteran. As that was back in those days, these guys, they would be in the service for two, four years, and then they'd come to college and they'd join the fraternities. And so anyway, and so he looked at me and he said, a young lady, don't you think it's time to go? I said, right. On the way home, he said, you want to go to a movie tomorrow? And I said, oh, Brad, I'm so sorry, I can't. He said, you've got a date with that guy, don't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> well, that was kind of the end of Brad. <laughs> so, and the beginning of Fred and Dinah. And just a little side note. At one point, we fixed Brad up on New Year's Eve with Fred's old high school girlfriend who lived in Muncie. 
and Brad came to our wedding. <laughs> so they did become friends. I've heard a shorter version of that, but wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really have. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. Everybody? Okay, thank you so much. We know a lot of people uh, love my dad. And, and if you have stories you want to share in the bar, you want to share around the, uh, you know, if you got to go home, go home. Um, but we, we've got plenty of time that we can hang out and talk. And uh, I'll eat it. Um, so anyways, uh, thank you so much everybody for being here and for celebrating uh, my dad and um, to see uh, the great one. We appreciate y'all being here and watching. Thank you.